Speaking of leadership, uh, especially in Minnesota, if any of you uh, have solar on your homes or appreciate the high penetration of wind power that Minnesota has enjoyed, or uh, the, the surge in electric vehicle ownership, uh, you probably owe a debt of gratitude to Fresh Energy as uh, they've been here fighting that fight and Michael's been doing it for 30 years. And uh, I met Michael when he spoke at the Wisconsin Energy Fair and was incredibly impressed uh, with his vision for the future and his depth of knowledge. And so would you please join me in giving him a warm uh, round of applause, Michael Noble. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for that gracious introduction. And uh, thank you, Mayor, for your, uh, your leadership on uh, climate change, you know, especially on uh, transit and bicycling and better buildings and renewable energy and district energy. Uh, we all appreciate so much that uh, you represented us and uh, so many other United States river cities at the Paris Agreement. I want to just say a few words as I start off today about um, you know, the terrible crisis hitting Florida on the heels of a rainfall in Texas that scientists now describe uh, statistically as an event that should occur once in 25,000 years, the rainfall event in Texas. There is absolutely no doubt that the warmer waters in the oceans help make Hurricane Irma the monster that it is bearing down on Tampa today. And uh, the Republican mayor of Miami uh, just yesterday directly challenged Scott Pruitt, the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator, and the President, and he said this about um, something that everybody in this room understands. The mayor of Miami said, this is the time to talk about climate change. This is the time that the President and the EPA and whoever makes decisions around here needs to talk about climate change. If this isn't climate change, I don't know what the hell is. This is truly, truly a poster child for what is to come. So today we're all watching and hoping that the people of Florida will be able to keep the loss of life there as low as Texas loss of life last week. You know, Irma is coming only one week after the most expensive hurricane in human history, over $200 billion in damages. Uh, again, a, a, a rainstorm that was described as a 25,000 year event. And uh, by the way, uh, the two prior years had 100-year events and 500-year events. So this hurricane that's bearing down today is so massive and the wind speeds are so high and they've been sustained for so long that some um, uh, hurricane experts are advocating a more terrible new grouping, a Category 6 hurricane. So without um, belaboring anymore this really horrible day in Florida, and the terrible weeks and months ahead for people who are suffering, both in Texas and in Florida. The true reality of our climate problem, the true reality of our climate problem is that we do not have very much time to make the very, very deep cuts in carbon pollution that we need to avoid the worst consequences of a changing climate. Right now, we are literally at the inflection point where big changes need to be coming much faster than they're coming now growing new industries and new technologies very rapidly, replacing the technologies of the past. So I want to start by saying that our electricity system is making fantastic project progress. Here's uh, Minnesota's electrical supply. In um, the last 10 years or 12 years, our coal um, contribution to our electric supply has dropped from 2 thirds to under 40% last year. And uh, that's because uh, coal plants have been retiring. It's been uh, as a result of advocacy and grassroots work and just plain the business case that coal is a money losing proposition and that wind and gas and solar are um, beating coal now. And funny thing is a lot of the momentum for retiring coal began right here at the High Bridge power plant down the river more than a decade ago when neighbors from downtown and neighbors from the west side and neighbors from the east side all came together uh, to press the power company that clean air, protecting public health, reducing carbon pollution, reducing toxic air emissions was what the neighborhood wanted, what the neighborhood needed. And over the last 12 years since that first campaign to retire coal right here on the west side and on Harriet Island and at the High Bridge power plant, 
Uh, wind and solar in Minnesota has grown from about 5% of our power supply to about 22% last year. Now, the point that I need to stress is that wind and solar prices are falling so fast now and renewables are really dominating the market for construction of new power supply. That just this summer, for example, Excel Energy got permission uh, to build about uh, build or buy power from about $2.5 billion worth of new wind farms. And I like to point out to my friends in the building trades, that's about three times uh, the total investment in the Viking Stadium. So um, $2.5 billion of new um, wind farms were approved just this summer. And this is what you got to know about this story. $2.5 billion of wind farms. Excel got over 30 bids to find the seven winners. And the seven winners who won those bids to either build power plants to sell to Excel or, or, or sell power on a long-term power purchase agreement, all of those power plants, all those wind farm power plants, all 30 bids were under 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour. All 30 bids were under 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour. So you had to be way cheaper than that to win the bid. Seven got selected, 20, uh, 30, 30, 30 were proposed. So wind power is so cheap now, so cheap now that a brand new wind farm produces energy cheaper than any power plant that Excel owns, including the ones that are all paid for, completely paid off. In other words, brand new commercial wind farm, a brand new commercial wind farm today Everywhere in the middle part of our country, from Canada to Texas, a brand new commercial wind farm can produce electricity cheaper than dumping train loads of coal. Just the coal itself. Not the power plant, not the workers, just the coal itself. It's cheaper. This week it was announced that there's now over 57,000 Minnesotans working in clean energy. And, and this sector grew incredibly rapidly between 2015 and 2016. So this is my wonkiest slide. I apologize in advance. I almost didn't want to use it. It's too wonky. But the, this is a uh, slide that shows how um, greenhouse gas emissions are, are going in Minnesota in uh, seven different sectors of the economy. Uh, this is from the Environmental Quality Board, a 2016 report. And the really fantastic news here is that the most carbon intensive part of our economy, the electric supply, is rapidly decarbonizing. The carbon in the blue bar is going down very, very rapidly. Similar to what I just showed you, about 17% reduction over the last decade. But in transportation, it's gone down in a tiny bit. And in other areas of the economy, it's been more flat. So this is the thesis of my talk today, is we're gonna capture this momentum and this power of cheap, renewable electricity and we're going to start to spread that fantastic news across all the rest of the economy. This is the same story, but using national data. The blue line shows how much carbon pollution comes from the power, power plant sector, the power supply sector, the electricity sector. And you can see, beginning in about 2004 nationally, the slope of that line is dramatically down. Again, that's because coal plants are uneconomic and that wind and solar and gas are now cheaper. So power supply is getting cleaner faster, and the slope of the line is fantastic. For the first time in the first quarter of 2016, the total amount of carbon pollution from transportation actually nudged up above carbon pollution from the electric supply. So the, the gold line is our transportation economy. And the black line, which uh, Fresh Energy staff was good enough to add to the slide for me, the black line is all of buildings and all of uh, factories combined. So buildings and factories have been go going down a little bit slow, but um, transportation hasn't hardly been going down at all. It had a dip in the recession. That's what the, the, the big recession in 2008 when gasoline was $4 a gallon, but now you can see um, that transportation emissions are heading on their way back up. So. Um, the good news about uh, transportation is that we can fix this problem. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about this slide. You know, the reason that that blue line is going down so sharp is uh, a closing of coal plants. There's a nationwide campaign called the Beyond Coal Campaign that Fresh Energy is very proud to be part of. 
and it includes economists and public health advocates and doctors and clean energy activists. Many of the people in the room have been working on this Beyond Coal campaign. It's really a national effort. And the, the heart of this Beyond Coal campaign has been to convince utilities and regulators and uh, government officials that coal is just not economic anymore and needs to be retired. And today, I just checked uh, the uh, website yesterday, uh, 257 coal units have been retired in America. And when we get five more retirements announced, we'll be over the halfway point. Who knew in the room that half of America's coal plants have been retired in the last 10 years because they're uneconomic? Who knew that? So that is dramatically good news that the, why the blue line is sloping down so sharply, this dramatic decarbonization of electric supply, because neighbors and communities all across the country did the same thing that the neighbors in the Highbridge community did. They decided that the coal plant was 50 years old, that it was polluting, that it was not economic, that there were better technologies, there were better and more suitable solutions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about transportation, and then I'm going to talk about um, buildings. And again, you could see that uh, transportation carbon emissions are edging up, uh, and building carbon emissions are slightly edging down, but not fast enough. So what I want to say about electric cars, uh, and I give credit where it's due, Andrew Twight on our staff has this line. He says, they match up with renewable energy like peanut butter matches up with jelly. It's a fantastic marriage marrying electric cars with renewable electricity. And let me explain a little why. First of all, um, I should just point out that cars are not getting more efficient. The technologies are getting better, but people are choosing bigger cars in place of the cars they used to choose. So if you look at the average fuel economy of the American car fleet, the average fuel economy, it was basically unimproved, completely unimproved from 1980 to 2015. There was no improvement in the average fuel economy of American cars for 35 years, none. And these cars over the last 35 years, the average car gets about 25 or 26 miles per gallon. Again, the technologies are getting better, but the cars are just getting bigger. Well, the first most awesome thing to say about electric cars is that there are now 22 cars being sold in Minnesota that the EPA has to figure out a new method for, what they call it, miles per gallon equivalent. It's, it's a little hokey, but bear with me. These new cars, these 22 cars being sold in Minnesota, which you can see all of them or most of them out at the west end of the um, Harriet Island yet today when we're done, these cars are all rated between 80 and 135 miles per gallon. Okay, they are way awesomely more efficient than average cars. So you might think, oh, well, maybe I might buy one of those cars or I have one of those cars, but um, can it really make the difference that we need? The cars that plug in that get 80 miles to 130 miles per gallon compared with a US passenger fleet that's basically stayed flat for 35 years at 25 miles a gallon, you know, the peanut butter and jelly analogy is that you're plugging your car in at night while you're asleep, but on the electric grid, that's when they're trying to figure out, what do we do with all this cheap wind power in the middle of the night? Like, put it in your car. Instead of buying tar sands oil from Alberta that refines at a refinery, put wind power in your car instead. Well, you think, oh, well, is it, is it affordable? Is that economic? Here's the comparison of buying wind power for your car to buying gasoline to your car. The bad news about gasoline is you never know what the hell it's going to cost. I mean, in, in, at the height of the recession, when, when, when you know, the economy of free enterprise globally was on the verge of the abyss, gasoline was $4 a gallon. That was actually one of the reasons the economy collapsed, is because people who bought houses out at the outer, outer, outer edge of suburbia couldn't afford to drive to be the produce manager you know, at the, at the grocery store anymore. It was too far to drive for $4, $4, at $4 a gallon in a car that gets $25, 25 miles a gallon. It was too far to drive. So um, if you just buy electricity from what I would call plain vanilla electricity off the grid, it's the blue line. But all of the electric companies are working to offer you half price wind power in the middle of the night. An idea called rate design. Let's design the rates in a way that encourage people to use energy when it's abundant and clean. So all the electric utilities in Minnesota either have an offer or are working on getting ready to offer a discounted nighttime all renewable rate that's half the price of the blue line. 
half the price of the blue line. Well, what family does not want to buy gasoline equivalent at 50 cents a gallon that's stable in price as far as the eye can see that has no carbon pollution and doesn't have to come from tar sands oil? I mean, this isn't like a crazy idea. This is a practical idea. So not only are these cars cheaper to fuel, these cars are cheaper to own. This is a UBS Warburg uh, comparing the annual maintenance costs of a Chevy Volt and a VW Golf. VW Golf is a fine car, but a Chevy Bolt, um, brand new Chevy Bolt, has an annual maintenance budget of about $255 a year estimate versus the Golf, which is a very reliable car, at over $600 a year. Again, saving a family uh, a lot of money when money is tight and people don't want to spend money on cars. So if you're charging your car at night and you're um, spending less money on uh, gasoline and you're not having to repair your car, that's why Larry Herkey, who um, left the National Guard to take on the lead role of sustainability for the state of Minnesota, basically he has Ann Hunt's job for Governor Dayton, uh, he uh, bought 22 Chevy Bolts before anyone else in Minnesota had a Chevy Bolt. And he didn't do it because he's green, although he is green. He did it because he believes in national security and he believes in um, savings. And his view is that each car that he bought will save the state of Minnesota about $5,000 in tax dollars over five years. So we, we helped a little bit with that analysis and his leadership uh, got those cars into the, um, into the uh, fleet. You know what I think is, I'm just editorialized, the biggest problem getting electric cars into government fleets is the government lets the employees decide what car they want. And I heard that over and over again, like somebody at the DNR says, oh, well, I need a four-wheel drive with, you know, a pickup bed because once in a while I might need that four-wheel drive. You know, it does snow, and like, yeah, but the Chevy Bolt can handle what you need. You know, not everybody needs a four-wheel drive with a pickup. So I'd say my, my ask me friends probably disagree with me, but take away the responsibility of letting the government employees decide what car they need. Take, away, take that responsibility away from them. So um, I hope many of you came here on uh, public transit or maybe you rode the new flyer electric bus over from the Union Depot. Now electric buses are coming into their own. Uh, instead of getting four miles a gallon, like a diesel bus does, or five miles a gallon like a um, hybrid bus does. These new electric buses are getting the equivalent of 21 miles a gallon. And the reason I show this slide is that um, um, moving away from diesel buses, diesel cars, and gasoline cars will be a huge improvement in air quality and public health, meaning that switching to electric vehicles and electric buses is a strategy for climate justice, for equity, just as much as is our, a strategy for saving money. This data here shows, uh, these two maps from the Pollution Control Agency, shows the rates of hospitalization for asthma on the right by zip code in the metro area and the hospitalization for childhood asthma that are directly attributable to concentrations of air pollution particulates smaller than 2.5 microns. So you can see that where the lowest incomes are concentrated and communities of color are most concentrated. Those neighborhoods are most impacted by polluted air and their children are most impacted by asthma. And asthma is the, um, of all the chronic diseases you might get in the world, asthma is, the, is the, um, the highest cause of absenteeism in school. So uh, the good news about these electric buses and electric cars in addition to public air quality benefits and uh, climate benefits and cost savings and economics is that it's great for the electric companies. You know, right now when the electric companies um, have too much wind power in the middle of the night, they, they have to sell it to Chicago at bargain basement prices or sell it to Indiana at bargain basement prices on the wholesale grid. And so the utilities are grumble sometimes like, oh, when I got all this wind power in the middle of the night, you know, and everybody's asleep, nobody's using wind power. So instead of, uh, grumbling about having to sell it at a deep discount to other states, which, you know, an environmentalist doesn't mind because people in Indiana finally get a little wind power. Um, you know, I could see it from the utility executive's point of view that uh, having these free batteries out in the community, cars and buses, 
uh, that you know people bought these for other reasons other than batteries, but you could put your wind power in these cars and buses in the middle of the night, and pretty soon we'll be grateful for having all these free batteries out there to, as we figure out what to do with all the solar in the late afternoon, too. So um, this is a slide that I'm surprising my key guy here, because uh, he never saw this slide, and he put the slideshow together, because this happened yesterday in Norway. Do we have any native Norwegian speakers here? Probably we do. Well, this is all the political parties in the country of Norway having a political debate yesterday. And the moderator asked him to hold up signs, yes or no. And the question they ask is, should we end all sales of all diesel and gasoline vehicles by 2025? And of nine political parties, the, the woman in blue, she's a little uncertain, so she holds her sign sideways and she's shaking her head like this. So what I'm gonna tell you is eight and a half out of nine political parties in Norway they answered the question, yeah. <laughs> that literally was the question. And I, the reason I know is, see the caption on the photograph? I put it into Google Translate to find out what it said. And the question was exactly what I put on the slide. Should we end all sales of diesel and gasoline vehicles in seven years? Eight and a half out of nine Norwegian political parties say, yeah. So, now you're saying, oh, well, that's Norway. You know, they're sort of like Minnesotans. They're sort of progressive and forward-looking. Besides, they wear skinny jeans and they're Europeans. But you would be surprised to know that Norway is not the only country looking to ban the sale of internal combustion engines. Norway is actually, this, this vote by all the political parties was supporting an existing Norwegian government policy Again, imagine all the political parties supporting the government. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Scotland is planning to end internal combustion engine sales in, in, 19, in 2032. India, the largest democracy in the world, is planning to end the sale of internal combustion engines in, in 2030. France is intending to end the sale of internal combustion engines in 2040. England is intending to end the internal combustion sales in 2040. And yesterday, as the Norwegian political parties were all announcing their support for the government's policy, China announced yesterday that they are just trying to decide what date they're gonna ban the sale of gasoline and diesel vehicles. China announced that yesterday. So, is there room for hope? Is there room for hope? <laughs> I thought you would love that slide, the Norwegians. Yeah, 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 me too, <laughs> yeah. Okay, back to this confusing slide. I'm, I'm gonna go to the second arrow here. We talked about power plants and coal plants and power supply getting greener and greener and greener. We talked about the problem of cars running on tar sands oil, sort of stalled out getting greener. And now we're gonna talk about buildings. Um, this is the greenhouse gas inventory for the city of St. Paul. Now that we're in St. Paul, we might as well use St. Paul as an example. And um, it's hard to get the carbon down in buildings. I mean, the reason it's hard to get the carbon down in buildings is buildings are kind of fixed infrastructure. They're, uh, you know, some of them are 100 years old. Uh, you know, your home, you know what, it's, it's hard to get the energy consumption down in your home. Um, and you saw that because we're building more buildings, carbon pollution in the building sector is actually going up. It's not going down. So um, this, the city of St. Paul is uh, doing some pioneering work on uh, buildings. Uh, well, first of all, our downtown is all heated with renewable energy. How many people knew that? Our downtown was heated and cooled with renewable energy. Yeah, up on the hill, there's the St. Paul District Energy System, and it uh, is a cogeneration power plant. And it mostly uses... Uh, wood waste from tree trimming, and that keeps the urban forest healthy, but other sources of wood waste from around the metro area is uh, the, the main source of um, both hot water for keeping the, keeping the buildings warm in the winter and, miraculously enough, cold water for keeping the buildings cool in the summer. Uh, so that's a little head start for uh, St. Paul buildings is that we have that fantastic renewable energy resource. But there's so many buildings in St. Paul that aren't downtown. So we're working in partnership with the mayor to bring some innovative policies to City Hall that can help. 
Namely, we need to start disclosing the energy consumption of buildings and hopefully sometime soon rental units to help stimulate the market for energy efficiency. I just think it's hilarious that it's obvious when you go buy a car, you would never buy a car without knowing, oh, this one gets 25 miles a gallon. <laughs> But you would buy a home without knowing what it costs to run the home, and you would sign a lease without no knowing what it costs to heat the home. And a commercial landlord might lease a square footage without the tenants knowing what it costs. So having transparency in building energy performance is going to really, really help energy efficiency. But even if the buildings more, are more efficient, and even if we uh, do use renewable energy to heat and cool buildings downtown, there's really no way to get the carbon out of the natural gas that I use to heat my water in my home or the natural gas I use to heat my home. There's no way to get the carbon out. No matter how efficient I get my home, I can't get my home to zero carbon unless I get out of the business of burning natural gas. So these two pioneers are doing just that. The one on the, um, I guess it's on your left, is a friend and donor of ours. And unfortunately, this house isn't in St. Paul, but he's remodeling his home, like a lot of people remodel their homes. And he decided to make his home so insanely energy efficient with triple glazed windows and um, very modern new insulation that he's gonna yank the furnace entirely. He's gonna clip his, his natural gas line and he's gonna heat this home with a heat pump using renewable electricity. And he's gonna heat his water with the heat pump using electricity. And the water heater on the right is a water heater that my 25-year colleague, Jay Drake Hamilton, uses to take showers every morning. Sorry if that's too personal, but um, <laughs> she and her husband, Pat, um, are the most meticulous carbon hawks keeping track of the carbon in their home. And they finally realized, wow, our water heater's a big carbon footprint. What are we gonna do, get our carbon out of our water heating? So they put in a heat pump water heater and they too run it on renewable electricity. So I just use these two little examples. Admittedly, they're pioneers. Admittedly, it's not happening up and down the street. But guess what? There's no reason it can't be happening up and down the street. There's no reason we can't be heating water and heating homes with um, renewable electricity. And I'm gonna talk about a, uh, another opportunity that, um, salute the mayor, He's, he had to run, you know, busy candidates literally have to run all the time. Uh, St. Paul has this once in a lifetime opportunity to show how a neighborhood development can be done right. This is a photo of the old Ford Motor plant on the Mississippi River. And over the next two weeks, uh, the city council will be voting on um, the city's plan, the mayor's plan, the planning department's plan for a brand new neighborhood right here on this site. How many people know this story well? How, how many people know this story not at all? Okay, so this piece of land is 130 acres. It's basically at the confluence of the Minnesota River and the Mississippi River. It's really, I think it's the best piece of real estate in all of Minnesota, probably. It's a, it's a great, great, great location in a great, great neighborhood. And the plan is to put uh, 4,000 residential units in here. Um, open up uh, Hidden Falls Creek so there's a river running through this neighborhood again. Uh, connect uh, shops and businesses to the city fabric. Reconnect all the street grid. Um, high quality transit, high quality bikeways. Incredible, incredible opportunity. But I wrote a little op-ed on the right because there's one aspect of the plan that just doesn't get talked about enough. And that's the vision that this whole community be net zero. Well, I apologize if that's jargon, but I'll just tell you. People in the, in the room who live in St. Paul, make sure your city council members know that you know about this and you want this part of the plan. We have the technology now, the economics are compelling now to make this entire economic development project net zero. And what I mean by that is imagine that the whole neighborhood within our city is so efficient with such fantastic buildings that they have a net zero requirement for energy imported to the site. And that all of the energy supplied to the entire community would come from renewable energy. Imagine you could live in this neighborhood with, maybe you have one electric car because you still like to drive to Chicago or drive to the North Shore once in a while, but maybe you live with no car because it has fantastic transit connections to downtown St. Paul and to the downtown Minneapolis and to the, and to the airport. Imagine you could live in this neighborhood completely carbon free. 
let's decide that now. Let's build that neighborhood now. 100% uh, emission-free, carbon-free, 100% renewable, net zero neighborhood on the verge of being voted at the St. Paul City Council. Make sure your voice is heard. So, you know, I have to just be honest that we can't electrify everything in one snap. And there's a lot of parts of Minnesota that aren't Highland Park and don't have the opportunity to build a net zero neighborhood. But look at across all of Minnesota, there's homes that deliver fuel oil to the home to heat the home. There's homes that deliver propane to the home to heat the home and to heat the hot water. This I call low hanging fruit for electrification. We can convert these homes to run on electricity, both space heat and water heat. We could either use on-site solar, as so many of you have done and so many of you know about, but we could also use renewable energy from the grid. Running water heaters on renewable electricity is exactly the same peanut butter and jelly marriage that running cars on renewable electricity. It's the exact same thing. And what it has in common is you don't really give a damn when the water gets heated. So put in the water heaters, make them smart water heaters, make them connected to the electric company, and this part of the room will heat their water at 11 o'clock, and this part of the room will heat their water at 1 a.m., and this part of the room will heat their water at 3 a.m., because none of you give a damn, you just want water at 6 a.m. You just want hot water. That's all you want. Let the electric company worry about it how you get hot water and what time you get hot water. So remember that the cars are charging too. You know, at 11 and 1 and 3, the cars are charging at 2 and 4. The cars take a little longer to charge than water heaters. But you can see that this, these batteries in the basement and batteries in the garage is great for renewable energy. It's a great solution to the problem of how much renewable energy can we actually manage. Because the problem is with renewable energy isn't whether we can afford it. Because remember I told you it was 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour was the 30 bids? The challenge is how much can the grid handle? And being able to put it in our cars and put it in our water heaters is fantastic solutions. So um, we actually are working closely with uh, the rural electric co-ops right now to help advance this vision. They are actually heating a lot of water heaters with electricity but we're not so fired up about um, switching from propane to coal fire electricity, so we wanna make sure that the water heaters are smart and make sure that the electric supply is renewable. So um, I'm sort of winding to the, uh, the point where I have to end. Um, you know, we call this idea the all electric economy, it's probably be more honest to call it the almost all electric. We're putting this idea in the very center of our business plan, we're imagining that our energy system could look like. Um, you know, we're thinking about wonky, oddball things like rate design. Imagine me talking to rate design to fire up a crowd. You, 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 though, you, you though, are that crowd. Um, you know, we can get uh, the Metro Council and XL Energy work together to get the entire bus system switched to bus, electric buses, say, 10, 10 years, maybe 12 years. They change out the buses about every 14 years, so if we, they sped it up a little bit, they should change them all out in a dozen years, or let's say 10 years, put the pressure on them a little bit. You know, this video uh, you can find at the Minneapolis Foundation, uh, it'll be in, um, you know, we're gonna publish the, this talk and we'll have a link to the video. It's a little four minute video pushing this, uh, this uh, electric electrification strategy. So, um, closing up, uh, the hard part of the economy is uh, not the cars and the, um, and the water heaters. The hard part of the economy is heavy industry. And uh, I just love it that Cummins uh, beat Tesla to the punch and this week unveiled a heavy duty electric truck. This is not a class, th how many truck drivers are in here? This is not a class eight truck, this is a class seven truck. So think of it as a beer truck around town. You know, it's gotta be able to haul a 22 ton trailer but it, it doesn't haul it to Albuquerque. It hauls it around town. But this is gonna be available in 2019. And uh, when I say they beat Tesla, I think Tesla's gonna announce their truck later this month, maybe, at the end of the month, perhaps, and they are gonna have an 18-wheeler. And I think they're even talking about a tech, a, an idea of switching out the batteries every few hundred miles. 
and have like a battery switching station, that might be possible. But Tesla and Mercedes and BYD are all not far behind. And the only reason I show this slide is just to show you it's just not the simple, simple, easy parts is the cars and the water heaters. The hard part is heavy industry. But we need to electrify everything or as much as we can. So quickly reviewing here, uh, do we want to avoid the worst consequences of a changing climate, a future that would be unimaginable? Can we commit to each other today that the day that this, uh, this hurricane hits uh, uh, Florida is a tipping point for us, that we're going to align our politics, our public policy, our priorities, our personal lives, our fastest growing industries, our innovative spirit, the public will, our electric companies? Can we align all those things behind climate solutions, bold action toward real global solutions? You know, as we begin to electrify everything, we can't let up the accelerator on getting rid of all the coal in the electric system. Remember, we had, uh, I think, 20 coal fire power plants in Minnesota 10 years ago. Does anybody have a guess how many we've closed so far? We either closed or have promises and dates to close 16 of the 20, and we have four left to go. That's where we are right now. So we must keep new gas to an absolute minimum. The new gas has to be an absolute minimum. There's very, very, very little room in the carbon budget that humanity has for new gas powered power, power plants. There's very little room left. So I will, I'm not ready to say there will be no gas and then no new gas, but we have to absolutely minimize it as we maximize wind power and solar power and energy efficiency and demand response and storage and water heaters and cars. We have to absolutely minimize our, our reliance on gas. We have to make everything insanely efficient, uh, as efficient as it can be. Uh, homes and businesses, yes, but heavy industry. We have to use lighting and appliances. All these pl great places to have huge leaps forward in energy efficiency. Our electric companies, our gas companies do a good job. And it's the role of public policy and advocacy groups like Fresh Energy help them do an even better job. Uh, new commercial buildings and homes, brand new homes are the easy and most cost effective way to really build zero carbon or near zero carbon homes. You know, these buildings, new brand new buildings are going to last for 100 years. So surely, surely we can build a building that would be net zero if we can build a whole neighborhood that would be net zero. Shouldn't we have a building code that's as good as that? Shouldn't we? So we, we have a bite at the apple to improve the building code every six years. I don't predict we'll win that this time we're doing it right now, but I predict we'll win it next time. So I've already told you this, that electric cars and electric buses are totally cost effective now. And that's true whether you're looking at a company fleet or the government fleet or the city fleet or whether you're a fixed income family that's looking for the absolute cheapest, most reliable car you can get your hands on. There was, a, I guess, a workshop yesterday on buying a, a used electric car, how many cars are available under $10,000. I mean, to get a car that's under $10,000 that almost never needs repair, that's a couple years old or three years old, you can fill up with wind power for 50 cents a gallon. This is the cheapest car a family can own. That's not, a, that's not an advocacy position. That is, that's economically true. It's the cheapest car. So don't let anybody say these cars are for rich people. These cars are for all people. These cars are for everybody. Electric cars are for everybody. So come out and see the electric cars. Um, I'm going to stop by saying that, uh, again, I want to get the electric companies in the saddle to help. And I always tease my friends in the electric companies, what part of ExxonMobil's market share don't you want? I'm here to help you get their business. Last time I checked, they're one of the biggest companies in the world, and you have a perfect opportunity to take away their whole business and make it your business. So again, the role, the role for public policy uh, is in government procurement and getting the incentives right, uh, maybe using the tax code, uh, go to the Public Utilities Commission, do some rate design. There I said rate design twice. Uh, make sure Sarah Clark hears that I said rate design twice. Um, and I think a good place to end this talk is uh, tipping my hand to our friends at XL Energy. You know, 
I know a lot of people just want to get off the grid. I want to get XL Energy off the grid. I want to get XL Energy off fossil fuels. I want to get all the electric companies off fossil fuels. I want no fossil fuels in the human economy. I have a big goal to have XL Energy be the national leader of all the electric companies getting the carbon out of their system. And I guess what the thing I think is they want that too. Here's three pie charts showing where their electricity mix was in 2004, where it was in 2006, and over on the right is um, their current commitment, their current plan for 2030. And in 2030, they will have reduced their carbon footprint by 60% from 2005. But I want you to know that right now, the company is working with a whole range of stakeholders on a new plan, the 2032 plan. And they have to officially submit that plan to the Public Utilities Commission in, in January, the first month of January 2019. But the cool thing is that they know that wind power is cheaper than all the power plants they have. They know that. And they also know that within that planning horizon, solar energy will also be cheaper than all the power plants they have. They know that. They know that. They know that energy efficiency is cheaper than all the power plants they have. So they're no longer asking, can we afford to do energy efficiency and renewable energy? They're asking, can we afford not to? They're, they're working on a plan to get rid of all the coal plants and the nuclear plants in the next 15 years. That's the plan they're working on. So again, our job is to kind of be their friend, but keep their feet to the fire, keep the politicians pushing, keep the regulators pushing. I know their goal is to be the company that showed the world how to keep rates competitive, keeps bills affordable, get all the carbon out of the power supply, but also stabilize their revenues long term. Rather than lying awake at night worrying about how many people are putting solar panels on their house, they should worry about you know, how many water heaters can we get on electricity? How many electric cars can we get in the garages? They, they can have stable, reliable revenue by electrifying the economy, by working with the Cummins Corporation to change out fleets, you know, to run heavy-duty beer trucks on wind power. I mean, this is a big business opportunity for them. So again, I tease my friends uh, there, uh, what part of uh, ExxonMobil's market share don't you want? So that's the whole uh, business plan that Fresh Energy has got. Um, if you want to be a supporter, if you want to help drive uh, a visionary and practical strategy, we welcome you to join us. We have a, a breakfast event, a fundraising event on October 4th at 7.30 in the morning at St. Thomas. We have an amazing uh, Dan Riker, who heads up an uh, energy and finance policy think tank at Stanford University. He worked for three different presidents, and he was the head of climate and energy for the Google Corporation, where he helped that company become one of the first companies in America to go all renewable. But what's inspiring to me is not, I mean, everybody's like, Google, oh yeah, Google. They have, some, they have more money than God, of course they can go all renewable. But what's inspiring to me is that almost all of Minnesota's Fortune 500 companies, almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them, are currently strategizing together, working together, how do we go all renewable? So XL Energy is being pushed by the 3Ms and the General Mills and the Ecolabs. Their very, very best customers want them to go farther and faster because they know it's cheaper and they know it's resilient and they know that it's helping to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. So we're going to need everyone, uh, homeowners, renters, activists, nonprofit groups, small businesses, big businesses, local government, regulators, state government, the governor. We're going to need all these folks on the same team. We're going to not leave any of these folks behind because we're obviously right now expecting no leadership from the federal government all the rest of us have to work together. So I see there's no reason why all of us in the room and those constituencies I called upon can't be on the same team and work toward an all-electric economy powered by solar and wind and the technology of the future. So thank you for coming and visiting with me today. Uh, 
Michael's going to take a few questions. Uh, so I'll come out here with uh, the microphone if anybody's interested. But while I have your attention, if you open the program guide for the energy fair, you'll see this evaluation called Shed Some Light. If you'd please fill that out for us and drop it off in an info tent or the pavilion, we'd really appreciate it. So if you want to ask Michael a question, come on up. Microphone's right here, just for courtesy for everybody to get to hear the questions. We'll only do, say, five questions, because there's a lot of other cool things to see. Hi. Um, I'm Chris Berta, and I'm interested to know on the, um, you said we've got to wait another six years to, for another policy um, map. The building code, you mean? Yeah, building code. Um, is there an opportunity to get all new buildings built, um, to have them solar ready? So that yep. piping is up there. It's ready to go. It's so cheap when it's new. That's, that's maybe something we could win this building code round. Every, every six years, we get a bite at the apple, and we're just planning our strategy for this, this round right now. So we're, we, we ran the table last time. We had 21 things that we advocated for in the building code, and we won all 21 of them. And uh, we did. And I, I had a conversation. The final decision maker was an old friend of ours named Ken Peterson, who's the commissioner of, uh, and he says to me on the phone near the end of the game, he says, I gotta give the builders at least one of these things. I gotta give them one. I'm like, no, because we have a record of evidence. All of these things are economic. You just have to make the decision. And he says, well, what about this mandatory blow order test? Does every building really have to have a blow order test? I mean, really, every single building need a blow order test? And I said, well, let me give you two pieces of information that aren't in the record. One, if I buy a house and the builder represents that it meets two air changes per hour, 50 pascals, and it doesn't actually meet it because there was no blow order test, do I just sue my builder or do I sue the Department of Labor and Industry too? That was my first question. And my second question is, I said, Ken, did you know that the manufacturer of blower doors worldwide is dominated by a company located in South Minneapolis? Oh my God, I didn't know that. That's really, really good information. I go, you don't find that in the record, in the evidence or record. It seemed like the Trump administration pulled out of the Paris Accord because of fear that China is kicking our butts in solar panel production. Uh, what, what do you have to say about that? Uh, you know, I, I certainly won't ascribe any motive to the president pulling out of Paris. I think it was just base political politics kind of rev up his base because his numbers were bad. I, I don't think there was any logic behind it. Uh, but on the subject of China and solar panel manufacturers, one thing I am a little worried about is a trade war that uh, is brewing right now. Uh, an American manufacturer is suing in the, you know, the international trade courts on unfair labor practices and unfair manufacturing practices in China. And uh, if that gets to the president's desk, uh, I'm quite concerned that he's going to put big import tariffs on solar panels and uh, disrupt the economics of solar for five years. Uh, that, that could happen as early as 2018. And just last month, the president apparently was ranting about, he said, bring me some tariffs. Bring me some import tariffs. I want some tariffs. So I'm quite concerned about solar energy and Chinese solar panels right now um, and whether we're headed into a trade battle. Another question. You get two, that's great. A follow-up right there. As soon as that whole thing in St. Paul at the Ford plant uh, closed down, I said, right there is a, a place where we could have a, a solar panel manufacturing plant. There, 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 was, there was hundreds of meetings and hundreds of community engagements and lots and lots of effort. Uh, there, was, there was interest in manufacturing, but you know, the land is so valuable that, that it's hard to just support manufacturing because manufacturing is looking always for cheap land. And uh, um, the land is going to support a whole beautiful neighborhood. And, you know, I think a solar, if I were a solar manufacturer trying to compete with the Chinese, I'd want like a one-story building, at, you know, in, in the lowest possible rent district I could possibly locate my building. So I, I think that I don't think there's going to be a lot of manufacturing jobs at the, at the Ford plant, but I know that was very, very, very thoroughly exa examined and thought about and looked at. I, I could be wrong. Some high-tech manufacturers could certainly wind up there. 
At a national level, the electric utilities are lobbying very hard to repeal net metering yeah. uh, all across the country. Yeah. It's happened in a number of states. Yeah. Do you see that happening in Minnesota? Uh, that is a long question. Uh, we lost a round this year. The rural electric company, the rural electric co-ops, you know, they're our frenemies. We are friends with them and we're opponents and adversaries with them. They came and they want to be able to add fixed fees, monthly fixed fees to people's electric bill uh, if you have solar on your roof. And uh, this is now in front of the Public Utilities Commission. The legislature said they can add fees, but they have to be using a method to calculate what the fee would be, make sure it's a fair process that's not just a punitive penalty kind of fee. So this is currently debating, being debated at the Public Utilities Commission, and I'm very, very worried about um, rooftop solar in rural Minnesota. Um, we don't have a movement to repeal net metering, but this would be a, an equally clever strategy to screw the solar installers. I'm very worried about it. Yeah, and that's been the case in a lot of states where they haven't directly repealed it. They've just added you know, on fees. The good story is that, is that they did it in, in Nevada, and uh, 2,500 2, jobs left Nevada the following day. And then the Republican governor had this as a very, very high priority on Governor Sandoval's list of things to do. And the Public Utilities Commission reversed it two years later and the jobs are all coming back. So, you know, whether it's exactly net metering or whether it's just really, really, really fair bill credits uh, that are close to net metering, there's a lot of public policy debate about exactly what's the right way to handle it. But the idea that, that the electric companies can just knock out the solar installers and end rooftop solar, I don't think that's politically sustainable. I don't, I don't think that electric companies can win on that. Thank you. So Excel is closing Sherco, but they're building a big natural gas plant there and they bypassed the Public Utilities Commission. <laughs> Why did they do that if wind is so cheap and what, what's going on in their head? Wow, that's a good question. You know, we, as you might have guessed, we were not in favor of that proposal. Uh, my, uh, my statement to Excel Energy was, you know, go to the Public Utilities Commission, show your homework, do the math, and their logic was, we got political problems in Becker, Minnesota. You know, we, we, they got three giant power plants that pay all the property taxes in Becker, Minnesota. Uh, we got to give them something if we're going to close power plants there. So it was, it was a very, very political decision that the politicians in the legislature and XL Energy and the labor unions all thought, um, if you're gonna close power plants, you gotta build a power plant. And the only extraction I got from the XL Energy on that bad decision, I should say this publicly, and then it's on the record, as they say, they said, that's the last natural gas power plant we will ever build. That's the last natural gas. I said, all right, that, that's the last natural gas. I never signed off and I never agreed to it because my argument was they, they hadn't shown the math. They hadn't shown the homework that they couldn't do it without it. And you heard what I said, absolutely minimize natural gas and maximize solar and wind and batteries and energy efficiency and demand response and electric cars and electric, and electric water heaters. They never ever did an analysis to show whether that gas plant could either have been avoided or it could have been much smaller. They didn't do the homework and they got away with it because the Republican legislature rolled Governor Dayton. That's what happened. Uh, so with two incredible hurricanes and burning up of the West, this really should be a national inflection point. That's what I say, yeah. And the other thing that's going on is we're having a serious look possibly at tax, at tax reform? Yes. Isn't this the idea, a time to put on the table with tax reform the carbon fee and dividend? Yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a long, long time booster of carbon taxes. Uh, uh, I don't think it's the silver bullet, you know, solve all, cure all, but getting a price on carbon, a fair price on carbon that escalates over time just drives this revolution so fast. And I, I think the carbon dividend people have done a fantastic job framing up the issue as a centrist idea, as a revenue neutral idea, as a, and not a carbon tax that grows government or give government a whole bunch of more revenues to spend. I, I would really love to see uh, tax policy be a part of uh, 
you know, the congressional discussion on tax reform, have carbon taxes. I think our local folks have done a great job of um, uh, communicating with uh, um, Congressman Paulson, who's a member of the Tax Writing Committee in the House of Representatives. And I also think that uh, folks in the room should be talking to the candidates running for governor about whether a, a revenue neutral carbon tax could be part of Minnesota's um, tax policy going forward. I think that's a big idea. You just did it before he left, huh? There you go. So thank you very much. We have one more question. You're the last one, Energy Fair. Okay. This might be a really, like, really ignorant question. No, I bet it's a fantastic question. <laughs> Is there a reason why more of the fossil fuel companies can't just be convinced to convert their operations to renewables? Mm -hmm. Why competition in trying to win instead of just change mm -hmm. so that they can make money off of that instead? You know, you know, big fossil fuel companies have toyed with that. Uh, I remember how many people are old enough to know, remember when British Petroleum uh, uh, changed their slogan to Beyond Petroleum? That was back in the 1990s. And uh, Shell is often cited as a, a company that understands that the future is solar. A company, a Shell company talks that way. I think the problem is, is that these companies are so massive and they have you know, so much of their investment in the wrong stuff that they, they only think they can be a bit player in the new industries, they can't be a big player. I don't know what the future is of ExxonMobil. I don't know, but I do know what the future is of Massey Coal and Arch Coal and uh, Peabody Coal. That those companies will be gone. But you know whether ExxonMobil has a future. Uh, you know, at one point there were 13 members of the board of directors of ExxonMobil, and three of them were Minnesotans. So I, I, I think that you know that, that they, their fiduciary responsibility to figure out. But right now they're hell bent on digging up oil and putting it through your carburetor and putting CO2 in the atmosphere where it belongs. <laughs> hey, Michael, I'm going to use my trump card and ask you one more question. Very good. Uh, what's our next big win in Minnesota? Um, wow. Do I have anybody? What's our next big win in Minnesota, Matt? Um, let's think about it a minute. What's our next big win? Oh, I know what our next big win is. Our next, our next big win is that we are going to rewrite the interconnection standards for connecting solar panels to the electric grid. From root to branch, we're tearing out the old standard, throwing it away, and have a brand new standard that's state of the art. Uh, we have a full-time person who's worked on it. She has a team of lawyers and economists and engineers from all over the country backing her up, and we're going to completely kick ass on that. It hasn't been written since 2004, and it's going to be rewritten this year. That's our next big win. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much.